Welcome to the Language of Leadership, and I'm really excited to have you here today with my colleague Erica. And what we thought we'd do instead of having um, a formal introduction, that we would introduce ourselves. So, Erica, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Lori. Hello, everyone. My name is Erica Gallegos Contreras. I use they, them, a uh, pronouns, and I'm a corporate program manager at the lab. And I'm really excited to be here to participate in WT2 as a first time speaker and also to co-facilitate this talk with Lori. The language of leadership is an important topic for me to further awareness of the binary view and use of language and the serious negative impacts it has on marginalized folks. Thank you, Erica. And my name is Lori Nishira McKenzie. I am the co-founder of the Stanford VMware Women's Leadership Innovation Lab, which has been a founding research partner of WT2 since the beginning. And I'm also a lead strategist at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And the language of leadership is really important to me too. I think about the ways that words are used that sometimes hurt people, sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously. And what I hope for all of us today is that we share together some frameworks and tools to be more conscious and thoughtful about the way we use language to truly deliver on the world that we hope to create where everyone is included and truly can thrive. So what we're going to do today is talk about the ways we use language. Now, this is not meant to be political, it's about politics. If you recall the 2016 elections, there was only one candidate who was described using this word, shrill. And researchers did decibel ratings and determined that there really was no difference in the level of volume that, that the candidates had. And yet only one was described as shrill. Go back to 1979 with Margaret Thatcher, and she was described, her voice was described as a cat sliding down a blackboard. Again, I think that could be how you say shrill in the United Kingdom. She had to think about not her political strategy, but how to get her ideas heard. Why would we describe a woman leader in this way? If we go back to current events or present day to current events in the Tokyo Olympics, there was the whole kerfuffle over women being described in this way. If we increase the number of female board members, we have to make sure their speaking time is restricted somewhat. They have difficulty finishing, which is annoying. So why is it that when we ask people to speak as leaders, to be leaders, we criticize for them? And I want to turn over this next example to you, Erica. And these criticisms are also made to criticize trans women as well, simply for just being. For example, Janet Mock shares, the media is not talking about my advocacy or anything like that. It's just about this most sensationalized meme of discussion of trans women's lives. Quote, we're not real women, so therefore if we're in relationships with them, we're deceiving them. Janet is simply existing and that's being condemned as deceptive or tricky. As she says, this can have serious consequences as it just feeds into those same kinds of myths and fears that the media spread around, which leads to further violence of trans women bodies and lives. So you can so, see these uh, words really can hurt people or be used in ways that don't reflect the society we want to value. I'm sorry, Erica, was there something else yeah. you wanted to say? No, no, no. <laughs> so what's going on here? Like an optical illusion, before we even know it, bias can affect how you see talent. It can actually limit the way that you are seeing the person in front of you and have you respond in a very stereotypical way. So let's take an example of that. If I were to ask you to picture a genius, you can enter it into chat if you like. Who comes to mind when you say picture a genius? So it turns out that most people will say Albert Einstein. And isn't it interesting that Marie Curie was the very first human being to ever win two Nobel Prizes. And the person next to her on the screen is Katherine Johnson, who many of us got to know through the film Hidden Figures. She's the mathematical genius who helped launch NASA's space program. So it turns out not only do we use words in ways that can be harmful or can really criticize people unfairly, we can also use words that 
and consciously limit whose talent we can see. Now you might ask, does that really happen still today? And I show you this uh, feed from the launch of Forbes 100 Most Innovative Leaders. They launched this list with the idea of recognizing innovation in our world. And it turned out that the list had 99 men and just one woman. Now, did they try not to see women innovators like Oprah Winfrey? I don't think so. It's that when we think about words in an unconscious way, it can limit who we can see as talented. And as Lori mentioned, most people would want to see candidates for who they really are and all of the talent they, they bring with them and to the organization. But bias and stereotypes can often prevent us from seeing the value of pe that people really are. And that's why we call bias and error in assessing talent. And this can cause various levels of disadvantages for people not based on their talents, but based on stereotypes. These resume audit studies are a great way to see the optical illusion because we see the exact same resume as used and all they do is change the name. In this study, which was done for an assistant professor of psychology position, the study administrator sent the resume out and asked how likely would you be to hire this candidate? 72% said that they would hire the resume with the assumed man's name, Brian, versus only 44% that said they would hire the resume with the assumed woman's name, Susan. Clearly the optical illusion here had them rate the resume of the assumed woman's name lower. Here are some further examples of, a similar, of similar audit studies. In the first study, um, the resume indicated that the candidate was a member of a gay pride organization in college and that resume was less likely to be called in. So you can see sexual orientation bias. In the second study, the resume indicated that the candidate had been a peer supporter for transgender women in college and that resume was also less likely to be called in. So you can see bias against trans folk. In the third study, the applicant with the stereotypically ethnic name received less callbacks and the administrators found that they had to send the resume to over 74% more applicants to get the same response. And so you can see ethno-racial bias play out here. And in the last study, the resume um, showed that the candidate had been part of a part parent-teacher association and also received less, less callbacks. So you can see bias against women with children. And all of these studies demonstrate how bias plays out in a number of different ways for different folks. So as we've seen, we can see that the, for the exact same level of performance, folks will be judged or viewed as less competent based on stereotypes. Now, this is the language of leadership and Erica and I also wanted to share how our automatic associations and stereotypes influence the words that we use and dig a little bit more into the research. So an activity for you to do, you can enter into chat, is to pick a word to describe job success in your role. It doesn't matter if you have a role in an organization, a role at home, a role in the community, pick a word to describe success in your role and think about the valued behaviors and attributes for people in your role and enter your words into chat. I'm gonna get on the table a little bit of like the words that we're associated with. What are the words that are around us? Now, it turns out that when researchers think about word types, sometimes it helps to see the categories we associate with certain words. So think about the words you just wrote and notice if you see your word more likely to be in one category or the other. The category labeled communal is the language of we, the language of collaboration. The words associated in the second column of agency, agentic words, are words associated with independent action or with I. Combined, both kinds of words are essential for leadership. But we tend to use words more automatically, sometimes in a binary that doesn't truly fit the leadership that we're looking for. Now, here's the challenge. If stereotypes influence the words we use, does that have any difference of advantage or disadvantage? Well, when you think about stereotypical models of leadership, we tend to think more of agentic terms. So in automatic associations, we are more likely to pick words that align with agency. We also tend to associate stereotypically men with agency. 
and stereotypical women with communal. So that when we're thinking about who we want to see as successful, who we want to promote, who we want to recognize, if we rely on stereotypes, we will end up describing people differently, even though it's not a binary, and we will end up valuing people more aligned with the stereotype of success. So these two categories help us see the automatic ways we think about leadership in order for us to redesign leadership to truly value who we are today in the workforces we want to work in. This is a study from Rate My Professor. The researcher Ben Schmidt took the millions of Rate My Professor ratings. Now in this, the people had to select what their gender is and they were given a choice of man or woman. So in this study, you can see there's very little crossover in the way we use language. There tend to be words we use for stereotypical men and words we tend to use stereotypically for women. And it turns out the kinds of words we pick have values assigned to them. And those automatic choices could inadvertently strengthen or, or weaken the advocacy you, you have for yourself and for others. So what we've seen is that for the exact same level of performance, we can in fact describe people differently in ways that can give them boosts or disadvantages and, and not reflect the values that we have. Now we wanna go on to criticisms. If you think of the kinds of words we talked about in the beginning of shrill or a cat sliding down a blackboard, those were criticisms or being annoying. It turns out that we also tend to use criticisms in ways that don't reflect general criticisms, but that are influenced by stereotypes. Let's look first at stereotypically men and women. In this study, what the researchers did was they had the actors interview for a job and two were told to act very modest, like, I'm just really grateful I'm here. Thank you for the opportunity. And two were told to toot their own horn so those are horns that they're tooting because in the US we say toot your own horn, nobody else will. Now this is a very US based context. In other countries, for example, in Asia, a phrase I've heard is the loudest duck gets shot. And I've heard in EMEA the phrase, the tallest poppy gets cut. So, in the US though, if you toot your own horn, you are seen as more competent. Now, does that get the competent man and the competent woman equally the job? The answer is no. The woman is not given as many opportunities because now she is not seen as being likable. Remember we talked about how stereotypes influence the words that are used to describe you. Stereotypes are also used unconsciously to use the or to define the words that criticize you. So being not likable is a criticism that she got. He did not get the same criticism. And as a result, the only candidate offered more opportunities was the self-promoting competent man. So what we can see is that stereotypes influence the criticisms you get, and that for the exact same level of performance, some will get criticized and others will get the job opportunity. So what does this all mean? How can we take our understanding of these barriers and ensure that we create a more equitable way of using language? One thing we've learned is that the automatic or very narrow definition of success does not match the way we want and need leadership to be defined today. So we need to move beyond these automatic or narrowly defined associations. And secondly, not only do they limit how we see leadership, they limit who we can see. These definitions tend to limit the advancement and sense of belonging of cisgendered women and marginalized folks. In other words, not only do they limit who we can see as leaders, they can create harm that can further create a, a culture where people cannot be their full selves and bring their best to work. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Erica, to talk about the costs and burdens of using language in ways that are disadvantaging to people. Um, so as Laurie explained, these limits are also costs and burdens. And an example is that words can penalize behaviors to reinforce the status quo. 
So when folks are simply existing outside of the status quo, sometimes they can be penalized for that. And here we're going to show you some examples. So we have here Sandra Garcia, a Dominican Black Latinx New York Times reporter who wrote about her and other Black and Latinx women's experiences in being told that they could wear their hoops or the earrings at work but not to client or to quote important meetings, despite her hoops and her earrings being a part of who she and many others are. So we're penalizing behaviors that are deemed with that's not for client meetings or important meetings. Um, and it's being shown that they're being policed for how they present themselves and show up at work. Lily Zhang is a amazing DEI consultant who advocates for folks to think outside of the binary. And as she puts it, recognize the time and the commitment needed to do DNI work right. And her work further highlights the fact that many of us use language in a binary way that penalizes folks that don't exist within the binary. Vera Bajarias, a nephrologist and doctor, participated in the Twitter stream hashtag MedBikini. And this happened just last year in response to a medical journal article that mentioned photos that included, quote, provocative posing in bikinis and swimwear could be deemed as, quote, unprofessional. And many doctors who identify as women spoke about the policing of social media behavior would often be forced upon women identifying doctors, but not men identifying doctors. Professor Tina Opie, an associate professor in the management division at Babson College, has published research about the experience of Black women in the workplace and when they're told that they don't look, quote, professional. And what they're essentially being told is to change and or straighten their hair to fit Eurocentric ideals and ways of professionalism. And all of these examples demonstrate folks for being penalized for any behavior that doesn't match our stereotypically narrow definitions of leadership or success. Another cost and burden is that we all know words are simply not just words, but the way in which we use language can and does levy um, taxes that drain emotional resources and police behaviors. This idea of an inclusion tax is a term coined by sociologist and author Sadale Malaku, who writes about the experience of professionals of color having to pay an inclusion tax. And this can be additional resources spent, such as time, money, and emotional and cognitive energy just to adhere to the norms in these cis white spaces. And LGBTQ um, and TGNC folks face a similar inclusion labor, um, inclusion labor tax. Um, to not only exist, but to protect themselves from this type of discrimination based on how others view their sexuality and their gender identity. Additionally, they can be policed by a feelings rule where they have to be extra cautious about if, how, and even when they decide to express disagreement or anger with this emotional and mental tax that they're undergoing. This tax even exists when we ask queer identified folks of colors to be advocates of their job. They report fear that if they did and when they do voice their reactions to political and personal injustices in the world and in the workplace, they would be deemed as aggressive or radical and could often face job loss or other professional consequences. So as you can see, words and language can demand explanations that inflict serious emotional burdens. This quote is from a study about the experience of queer staff of color at an LGBTQ college resource center. Here we hear from Beyonce, a Mexican American lesbian non-binary employee and they share, my job requires justifying the need for LGBTQ plus education, convincing them it's in their best interest to be educated about these issues so they share it with their department. To be effective, I have to elicit empathy so I share stories about students who struggle and what mar being marginalized feels like. I have to prove a certain level of trauma can and has happened before the, the faculty and staff can see why having education about these issues would help. I relive my trauma in those sessions and those students do it too to make a point. So we can see the way we choose or are aware that we choose not to use language costs a huge burden on the, on the experience of LGBTQ plus and TGNC folks. Is there anything about that? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> 
So when we think about strategies, it often can help to take a moment and think about, as Erica described, the costs and burdens of the words we use. Sometimes we're on such automatic pilot, we think, oh, we always describe leadership as genius, or we always do that. Shouldn't people try to fit into this? And I think we've shown that we can place unnecessarily hurt or harm on people, and in fact, limit our ability to see talent as it truly is. So if you've also experienced some of these, as Erica said, it's not necessary that you have to now go educate people on the cost and burdens. You can if it's a choice for you. But think about what if instead we could create workplaces where people didn't have to be the ones making that choice for themselves. Do I speak up or not? What if instead all of us created a sense of using language where people could truly be themselves and recognize for who they are and weren't the ones grappling with whether they speak up or not about something that might be harmful or discriminating to them. So what might those strategies be? We're gonna share a few and then we're gonna open up for Q&A because we wanna hear more questions, suggestions, strategies that you have and truly make this a more interactive platform as much as we can um, you know, in this Zoom world. So one strategy you can take to really redefine the power of language is to think about the terminologies you use of success and go beyond a binary definition of leadership. And what do we mean by that? So as we said, we often describe leadership in an either or way. You're either going to be driving or you're going to be thoughtful. We want someone who shows up as professional, not someone who shows up as personal. And this binary way of seeing leadership instead of an and way where you can define success really does limit both our ability to see leadership and our ability to make people feel welcome in their leadership. One way is to think about combining both agentic and communal terms. So if we really usually look for a driver what if instead you looked for a driver who's a great collaborator? How you get works done matters as well. This will not only create a value of collaboration and of getting stuff done, but it'll also enable you to see more people as leaders. What if you acknowledge someone for being warm and ambitious, recognizing all of what they bring to your workplace? What if you think about people as being both thoughtful and risk-taking? This simple step can really help you be more able to see leadership, to redefine leadership for all that it can be, and to create spaces where people can show up. I know sometimes after talks like this, people look at their LinkedIn profile, and I know there's been some great um, opportunities to look at how you describe yourself and to see if unconsciously you've also fallen in, into any of this kind of binary definition of leadership. And are there ways you can expand how you both describe your own leadership and how you endorse others on platforms like LinkedIn? The second thing that you can do is to question terms like professional, executive presence, and acceptable. These might be inadvertently used to hold people down or to limit their self-expression. Um, a colleague in my, and I wrote this article, The Cost of Fitting In, that really looks at the way professional is used to diminish people as opposed to have a, a fair and equal standard. Erica talked a lot about the way Black women are told to conform to Western-centric hairstyles. People are told to remove jewelry or to, to behave differently at work. These often aren't producing better outcomes. They're really outcomes that place a cost on people and are policing behavior to a very narrow definition of success. Um, lastly, I encourage all of us to make space for intentional and active curiosity and growth around the power of language. Um, language we know is ever evolving and will continue to evolve and change like us. And I encourage all of us to really see it as having a growth mindset that we may not always know all of the language or how to push the boundaries of language, but that we do not allow that to stop us from knowing or being wrong and from continuing to learn and grow. And so I've been at the lab for six years and I've seen and co-facilitated this talk several times in the past. Oh, <laughs> just my computer. Um, 
And I have also grown as the lab has grown into a beautiful space and I'm in a different part of my journey. And when I was asked to participate and co-facilitate this talk, I felt comfortable and eager to not only talk about the language of leadership, but also include a new dimension that hadn't been part of it before. So as previously stated, I'm taking this opportunity to further awareness of the binary use of language and also terminology such as TGNC. I've been using this um, word in the presentation so far, and for folks who may not know, TGNC stands for Transgender Nonconforming People and Identity. And transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity does not match their sex at signed at birth. So we have a beautiful image right here to kind of depict that. <laughs> As you can see, um, trans is an encompassing of many beautiful different gender identities and gender expressions, not just uh, trans women or men, and also some trans folks who are trans um, choose to be referred to as just women or men without trans in front of it. It's really up to the individual to disclose and choose that for themselves. And there are many expanding identities within the trans identity such as gender queer, gender fluid, third gender, gender non-conforming. And all of these identities are expansive and evolving as we go. And for those of you who may not know, cisgendered is someone whose gender identity aligns with their sex that signed at birth. So that is cisgendered women or cis women and cisgendered men. Um, I believe it's important to have awareness and learn about these gender identities because gender identity does not define or so gender expression, my apologies, does not define someone's gender identity. Um, it's our next slide. Um, gender expression, uh, for those who don't know, is how we present our world and ourselves in the world. So it could be our mannerisms, our clothes, um, our name, our pronouns. That's how we express ourselves and how we see others in the world. But that doesn't automatically tell us what their gender identity is. And their gender identity is their internal experience and naming of their gender. It can correspond to or be different from sex were signed at birth. Um, and as you can see, those are not the same. And these are also evolving for folks as they are throughout time. Um, and it's important to allow people to disclose this to you when they feel comfortable. And if they feel comfortable, there's no need to um, force folks to do that, but it is important to keep these in mind and encourage folks to share their pronouns in meetings so that folks can feel valued and respected in the spaces. So I want to take some time to thank you all for being here today. It really means a lot to us that you're willing to engage in this conversation with us and hope it's for the same reasons that, we, that we're here because we believe we can create a more equitable world that benefits us all. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And now we'd like to hear from you and the questions you have. Yeah. Um, so, so far, we, we just have one question. So I encourage everyone in the chat, um, please add your questions to the Q&A. Um, the first question is, what do you feel is and depicts the, lang the true language of leadership? I can start, say. Erica, and then oh, do ahead. you want to kick off? Okay, so I love that you use the word true, because I think true can be a way of questioning and interrogating what leadership is. And as Erica said, what if it's always evolving? And there isn't a fixed true nature, but one that evolves given the time, the concerns and the values of an organization. So I would say that perhaps expansiveness is one of the key characteristics of leadership that we'd like to uh, promote today. And of course, one that's responsible for curating the experience of those around us. That is not just a sink or swim world, that we have an ability to have a responsibility, a joyous responsibility for creating environments where people thrive. And those are two things I'd like to have us consider in this ever evolving, perhaps true nature of leadership. And Erica, and I wonder if there's anything you, you'd like to add to that as well. I think you said it beautifully, Lori. <laughs> I love that you uh, use the word expansive. Uh, that's definitely something I wanted to bring up. And I love that you talked about the beautiful responsibility and also the agency that we have to not only allow leadership to um, expand not only for ourselves, but for each other and to allow everyone to be part of that conversation and part of that change. 
No, I, I just want to add one thing to what you said, Erica. I've loved doing this presentation with you and allowing myself to be changed through these interactions. And I, I'm happier with who I am because of you. And to me, that's part of leadership, that how we see ourselves and our knowledges and our expertise evolve because of our connection to others, not just the drive and perspective we bring to ourselves. So I also wanted to really thank you for being part of this with me. It's made just a huge difference and I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, facilitating with me and shit. And thank you for having us. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. I know, we, I have, know. <laughs> we have more questions, but they're coming in. Um, so here's one. How can we respond well to question someone using language we feel is not inclusive? E.g., how do we question executive presence in the moment? So what are the things we should be saying? So Erica, do you want me to kick off or do you? Okay, I'll, I'll kick off. So one of the things we talked about in the beginning of the research presentation is criteria. And the way that our unconscious criteria shapes the word choices we use and the, and the evaluations we make and assessments about people. So when I think about executive presence, there's some unconscious or inherent criteria embedded in that term. And it's those criteria that turn out to discriminate against people. Often it means presenting yourself in a way as kind of a cisgendered white man might have been perceived before. Definitely not wearing hoop earrings, not having natural hair, perhaps not being small. So all of those factors that are unconsciously embedded in, in executive presence, you can make visible and then discuss them. So for example, if someone else is being criticized, let's say a candidate for a job is being criticized for not having executive presence, I might try to break it down. We said we want someone who makes teams feel comfortable. We said we wanted someone who brings the best ideas out of our team and creates the value of diversity. We said we wanted someone who has done a great job in the past of leading client engagements. That to me is executive presence. Could you explain to me what other elements of executive presence you see that aren't here? Because if there are elements that are included, interesting, we didn't include that in our criteria before. If we think those are important, we should reconsider our criteria. And if not, maybe we should stick to our core criteria. What do you think about that? So often when these terms are used, if you interrogate the criteria underneath them, you could get to it. Now, what if people say, well, we just don't want someone who has long hair and, and gray in it. That just isn't the client image we're going for. If she comes here, we're gonna ask her to dye her hair because we don't want her presenting as an old lady. There couldn't be a chance for you to really move beyond criteria and say, you know what? We said we valued diversity. We want to, not only say it, we want to enact it. And part of that is expanding definitions of success and proving that people, no matter how they show up, can be successful. So sometimes if the criteria doesn't work, going to bat and really changing, allowing the culture and the definitions of success to change right in front of you. Um, Eric, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I, I love your story also of how over time you've allowed your expression to evolve and become more public. And in that way, you are also changing definitions of things like professionalism, executive presence, all of that in your own actions. Yeah, I think you put it perfectly. I think when um, I, under, I want to, uh, I think I understand how maybe scary or uncomfortable it can be to sometimes question like, like what does executive presence mean, especially when it's someone who might be at a senior or above level before us. But I think the way you asked, talked about it, Lori, is great. It's just asking them, well, what do you mean by that? What does that look like? And like writing out, what is that criteria? All right, now we're going to use that criteria to evaluate everyone. We're not just going to skip over or if it comes up when one candidate is being talked about, it's like, oh, this person doesn't know the executive um, leadership, I think you had said, sorry. Executive presence. <laughs> um, executive presence. Executive, yeah. Thank you, executive presence. It's like, okay, well, what about that? And like, did we use that criteria for this other candidate? Mm -hmm. What, let me ask, uh, this is my own follow-up question, but what if there are things like a dress code? You know, when I started my career at the telephone company, women were not allowed to wear pants. We had to wear skirts. 
So, which was really annoying in Rochester, New York when it would be sub-zero. So, <laughs> um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, is the expectation the organization needs to change now? Or how does one deal with that? You know, I think um, the answer to that <laughs> also lies in what position of authority you are in an organization and how safe your, comf your, your environment is for you to be able to rock the boat without being shoved out of the boat, right? So if you're in an organization that truly is open to having these conversations, I often say start with someone who can help you work out how to have the conversation. Someone who agrees with you, perhaps as an ally in the conversation and help you figure out how to change hearts and minds. We often say you can't often create true change without with a mandate. You kind of need to involve people's hearts and minds. So if I said the dress code now changes, there could be some ways we've missed you know, to some of Erica's points earlier, how talking about dress code in an environment where we have people of all sorts of identities could be inadvertently even more off-putting if we changed it to saying like, well, who does get to identify as a woman wearing pants or not pants, right? So I think part of the solution is having conversations to figure out where all of your biases might even be creeping into the, the new policy figuring out how to have the conversation and to win enough of the hearts of minds so that when you do it, it's seen as part of your mission. So if our mission is a place where people truly can thrive and I can nest this new requirement inside of that, hopefully I can win hearts and minds. And if not, find out like what's missing that we might be inadvertently reinforcing a new bias with this new policy. And so conversation, collaboration, figuring out what works as a journey, not a destination, really can make sure you're not bringing new biases in or inadvertently leaving people out of what you're trying to do for the good of everyone. Okay. Um, next question is, how can we meet people? Well, this question has multiple questions in it. So how can we meet people where they are? How would you convince someone who refuses to change their language? Or how would you educate an ally who wants to change but, but doesn't know where to start? How would you educate leaders, managers, ICs differently? So Erica, really, how do, we, how do we have that conversation? Erica, wanna, would you like to take a stab at this one? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say all the questions that were just asked. I'm like, how do I want to respond to each of these? <laughs> um, do you I want think, me to break them down into one at a time? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. So the first question is, how can we meet people where they are? Mm -hmm. So how do you convince someone who refuses to change their language? Oh, okay. So I think this is a very important, valuable, and, and interesting question as well. Um, Lori, you can uh, add additional after I answer, but I Perfect. think for me, um, it's an interesting experience, obviously being um, a person who knows about this language and kind of wanting to further the awareness of others and encourage others to use the um, language that is um, respectful and inclusive of others. Um, and meeting people where there are is just kind of this is my own personal, I guess, experience and how I have um, been doing this, but I cannot say that this is how someone else of the TGNC community will want to or should do this um, in educating others, but just kind of letting uh, folks know like, oh, I have heard you say this, you, I've heard you identify everyone here as women. Well, actually, I just want to make sure that we make sure we talk about so, like this is a cisgendered woman space not that it's only but it's just like there's mainly cisgendered women here or it's just women of all um identities um and in, once there's some training or like language or conversation around language with this person or these individuals kind of and they continue to use this being like oh i we had this conversation before around language and i'm hearing you that you're not using the language you talked about, it's okay to make mistakes, but is there something that you want me to further explain? Or is there some resources that you want to look into or that you want to hear about? 
um, because I understand that it, it does take time to kind of integrate new language when we're speaking um, and we're gonna make mistakes. Everyone will make mistakes. No, I wanna make sure that no one is like, not no one even inclusive in the TGNC community will make mistakes sometimes, but it's okay. Um, just in that moment, trying to clear it up as soon as possible and kind of moving forward, but not putting the responsibility on folks of the TGNC community to educate all the time or to be the person to speak up and say something is what I think is what's most critical. Um, Laura, did you want to add something to that first? Sure, I, love, I love all of what you said, Erica, and, and what you underscored was sometimes the role of education can be to create some common frameworks. There are things that we didn't learn. They don't teach gender bias in any educational system, right? We have to learn these ideas on our own. And we don't learn about identity in school systems. We don't even know the names of parts of our body, right? So there's so many things that we don't learn in our educational system. So I love what you said, Erica, is what thing organizations can do is education on the way that words and language can be unconsciously uh, ca cause harms to people and also limit us from seeing the talent. Then when people, as you said, accidentally use something, really rem reminding them and, and asking like, do they, I love what you said, do you need help figuring this out? I also had to learn how to use certain things as well. And I was embarrassed sometimes to, to use them um, incorrectly, especially in the roles that we have where we're expected to know everything and to, um, try to practice some vulnerability and humility about my own um, kind of foibles in order to create space for others to as well. And um, the last thing I'd say, Jerry, about the way you asked the question, like how can you meet people where they are so you can change them? That's not actually meeting them where they are right? In where people are usually is that where I am is pretty good, right? And, and so meeting them in order to change them isn't really meeting them. That's only meeting part of who they are. So um, my friend Carolyn Samard has taught me a lot of work on what's called perspective taking, which is cognitive empathy. And when I can really appreciate what it's like for someone to struggle with terminology or to be uncomfortable with it, when I can truly appreciate that world, then together we can co-design, co-create a way that we can together fit, find a way that people can feel included around us where we can have vulnerability to make mistakes. But I think meeting someone in order to really isn't meeting them. So maybe even rethinking that word choice to meeting them so I can appreciate, and then co-designing with them a way we can use language in a constructive way that does benefit all, create a more equi equitable world. Well, it, it is funny because the person did put uh, in, in quotes, meet people where they are. So um, they must have known there was an issue with the question too. Um, so it, the next part of this question is, you know, and I think this these two pieces can go together is how would you educate an ally who wants to change, but perhaps doesn't know where to start? And how would you educate leaders, managers, ICs differently? Are there, you know, my question to add to that is be like, what are the, re I mean, I think everyone recognizes the burden it places when you're asking the person being impacted by the language to constantly re-explain. And I've, I've had a number of women I've seen in groups that I'm in, um, you know, say, I don't, I don't have the strength to educate you about, you know, the problems in my community. Um, so what, what are some of the good resources? Where, where do we need to go? That's really great. That's a great question. Um, I would like, be like, because I am grow up with the internet, I'm always kind of wanting to be like, look, go on the internet, but I know the mm -hmm. internet is not always the best place. <laughs> Um, but I think something that you can start is kind of looking up LGBTQ resource centers. LGBTQ resource centers are not just for people in the LGBTQ community. They are also for allies. So those are great places The um, if you are local or in the area, I mean, everything is now thankfully online. And I feel like there's more and more webinars and trainings online. The LGBTQ resource center in San Mateo has an amazing, um, uh, I think it's like kind of two, uh, 
trainings where you can learn about this language and they can facilitate that for you or your department, your team, your organization. Um, but I think that turning to those um, resources is definitely the first place. And I'm really glad that you highlighted, Jerry, that it's not a great time to always turn to the person who is part of that community to explain it to you. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely not true. But there are amazing people in the community who are doing this work who want to do it. And it's most important that you contact if they there are kind of, I think we had mentioned, um, or we had mentioned Lily Zhang um, is an amazing individual who is doing this work and educating folks about the binary use of language um, and on her website if you kind of google her and find her website she has amazing information about the work that she does and how she does it and other folks that she can re refer you to i think it's most important that when you, these um, folks from the community are either consultants or if it's someone in the workplace who is like yeah i'll do this i think what's most important is to acknowledge the emotional and physical time and energy that they are taking to do this and to compensate them. That's the most important thing um, because we need to value them for what the knowledge that they're bringing and that they're spreading. Um, so that's kind of where I'm gonna begin. Go ahead, Lori. <laughs> Those are amazing resources and I completely agree. And it turns out we tend to get ideas from a fairly homogenous network. We tend to follow people like us on Twitter. We tend to like articles that are from people like us. And one of the projects I've done for myself over the past few years is to think about communities I don't hear from and try to intentionally follow them. So um, Erica, you also shared Janet Mock as a thought leader for the TGNC community. And what I tend to do is if I find someone like that, I'll follow them and then I'll see who else who's in their community and slowly build my network. So I'm not just hearing from people who I perceive to be like me. We have more connections than we do on the surface, right? And, and try to make sure that I'm hearing from and educating myself over time on how are people responding to the AA, the Asian American Pacific Islander violence? Like there's a range of reactions, people even in my own community, how they've been reacting. So I try to expand also who I'm listening to, who I'm doing projects with, how I'm thinking about whose voices influence me and ensuring that it's not homogenous. And in that way, discovering so much about the world that I didn't know, I didn't know. So um, in addition to finding thought leaders, start following them, follow their voices, see who else is in their community and have them be part of your community. That sounds great. Okay, next question. Um, what actions can we take to change the way success is perceived or value at our organizations? How can we change things like performance evaluations and promotion decisions? Since success, those are two things very closely tied to success. Yeah. Sorry, you take that first. Okay. Um, it turns out that most organizations have values of both what get done, what, what gets done, and how the work gets done. And often the embedded definitions of success are in the how work gets done, in what we say good team playerness is or good innovation is. The how work gets done is often what we need to redefine. So let's say the organization values innovation and says innovation is what we value in our organization. It turns out like the term genius, when we say innovative or innovative leaders, we tend to think of stereotypically men. So that very term itself could be what's limiting your organization from valuing people. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to not value innovation, but perhaps you can change what you value about innovation. It turns out, for innovation, you need ideas coming together to truly think outside the box. So what if your organization defined innovation as creating conditions where teams come together and can spark new ideas and solve harder problems? If I valued innovation as the conditions for innovation that spark new ideas, that would broaden the definition of even an existing value. Another one is execution. Execution tends to be defined as you got the work done. 
What if you redefined execution even as creating collaborative efforts that everyone was able to produce better? So thinking about redefining success in the how work gets done, and then looking at each term and making sure that it is expansive and seeing how you can value broader definitions of success and using this to interview. Do you use those questions about collaboration and um, for innovation in your interview, for performance management, for promotion decisions? Are you saying you value collaboration, but the person promoted didn't get promoted based on collaboration, but on their individual drive? If you redefine success and then truly use it to make these key decisions, you might start to not only shift your own lens, you might create workspaces where people can more fully be seen for what they're contributing and feel more that they can thrive in your organizations. That sounds great. Um, those are all the questions we have. Any, if anyone in the community, our audience has a question, please post it in the Q&A now or we will, I'm giving them all a second to do it. it. It's interesting, I think the hardest thing is, you know, performance evaluations where they have those wonderful things like things you can change about yourself personally. You know, they always have the professional and then they go to the personal. And I find those not pleasant. <laughs> yeah, I think you point to an important finding, um, Jerry, for. Um, people we perceive to be women, mm -hmm. we tend to use more descriptions about them, about their personalities. Mm -hmm. So in general, we aren't equally asking people to talk about their personalities, which is an inherent trait. Mm -hmm. Business really is about the skills and behaviors you're enacting. But around women, we tend to focus on their behaviors. Like you had sharp elbows in that meeting or um, to people of color, like you um, didn't present yourself well in front of the client. So thinking about the ways that even if our performance evaluation asks us to use personality-based descriptors, focusing instead on skills and behaviors. So exactly. if my workplace said, describe the personality that let you be successful, I would say, oh, I enacted these skills, I collaborated with these people, I made space for people. And even if they don't call those personalities, I, I think I would be seen as doing my performance evaluation correctly, but I wouldn't be falling into that, that trap of using um, ways of describing people that just don't match what we um, really need in a work context. Yes, I, it's interesting because I've often seen you know, in behaviors when I worked in corporations that there would be men who would be completely disrespectful to women. Yet I never heard once of that being counted against them in a review, but women would get nailed for being angry because they were being treated disrespectfully. So you end up in kind of a no-win situation. Ah, we do have two more questions. Yeah, I knew y'all were just typing away. Um, can you say more about language in self-evaluations? Sure, Erica, do you want to go? You want me to start? Okay. So, you know, um, we often think of bias as someone who's not like whatever the disadvantaging pattern is doing the bias against the people who are in the disadvantaging pattern. And it turns out because our biases are shaped by shared societal beliefs, we ourselves can be subject to those same patterns. So you might say like, Lori, you're an Asian woman. Why are you enacting behaviors that fall into the model minority stereotype? You should know better. And the thing is I'm part of society and can be unaware that I'm being influenced by these norms and, and these stereotypes. So one thing I'd say about our self reviews is that we might also be bringing those narrow definitions of success to the way we see ourselves. And we might be unconsciously penalizing ourselves for not living up to the way that our company sees executive presence, for example. And we might be using an automatic use of language, like only using communal or only using agentic language. So just like in a performance review, a manager might write for someone else, when I write my own, I also give myself a mini rubric. Mm -hmm. 
And I try to make sure that I recognize um, what I value as leadership, which is generosity, vulnerability, being um, someone who creates collective good, not someone who's only for my individual good. So I kind of give myself some tips or I guess writing in language ideas um, to make sure that I'm not following any of those patterns. And I know, Erica, you've been such a proponent of not using a binary sense of what leadership is or expectations are as well. And, and I imagine there are ways that you could even change the way we do performance reviews, but think about as you uh, have evolved yourself over time, how you've maybe changed the way you've used language in, in, in the way you write your reviews. Um, I think you bring up a great point around your own experience or just the example of kind of the biases that we have in our own minds that we then come out when we're trying to evaluate ourselves. Um, something that I have, I think I would be very honest and say that I'm still working on myself. I think I'm constantly trying to unlearn and redefine and relearn what success means for myself and trying to keep that in mind when doing my self-evaluation. Um, something that I have learned is also sometimes speaking about yourself in the third person when you're doing the self-evaluation, really think about like, how are you going to describe this close friend? The close friend is you, of course, and it might seem a little silly, but how is it the best? Because we talk about, and we've, we've heard from, I think from several different people that sometimes we're just very self-critical of ourselves. And that's kind of where this bias and these stereotypes can come up, but that's not how we would really speak to a loved one or a friend. So doing that for your own self, or even just bringing in and asking your peers and your colleagues that you're close to or folks who are hyping you up and reminding you of the amazing leader and person that you are, asking them for some time or some support in being like, what have you heard me say that I've done? Or what is it something that, um, can you look this over and tell me if I'm missing something? Really like turning to your peers and allowing that to be something that's part of your process. Um, and I think it's really great to have kind of that practice of writing out kind of Lori, what you said is like, what are the things that you define as leadership? I know in the past we had heard um, from our colleagues around like using the, the communal and agentic language. We used to have them kind of printed out and we would share them with folks at our conferences. Um, <laughs> we can't do that anymore, but having that out to kind of remember when you're writing out someone's um, like recommendation letter or of you having that out for yourself, but adding that in, adding in what is it that you feel is also part of uh, leadership and success. That's great. We have one last question and we have two minutes, so I think we can handle this one. Um, what about places where language has an impact that we may not think as much about? Um, for example, marketing materials, company websites, mission statements, even things like room names that can be gendered. Mm. That's such a great point. I say, go for it. Ask the questions. For whom could this be causing harm? For whom could this accidentally create a space where they don't feel welcome? And then have the courage to go ahead and change those names, those images. We, the, the further you are away from someone, the more likely stereotypes fill in the attributes you think about someone. So the challenge with marketing is you have a marketing type. It's not a person. So when you create the type, you tend to use stereotypes to define them, caring or aggressive. So one thing is to recognize that you likely will bring stereotypes into the way you pick pictures and use words to describe anything in marketing or rooms. Mm -hmm. Have the courage to figure out that it's time to change. And then as Erica said, have a posse, have a collective because no matter how good you are, you might bring a stereotype to what you're doing. So the more you're able to crowdsource allyship, which is the term we're discussing at, at, at my work, um, the more you can crowdsource that, the more you can ensure that you're not bringing these unconscious biases to the work that you're doing. That's great. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> we I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to encourage people to do it. Like, let's do it. Let's start now. We know that language has and continues to evolve and let's not be afraid. Let's do it. Why not? Because this is the perfect time to do it um, and have these conversations. Yeah.
we've all been away from the office for over a year. So yeah, so let's go change all those room names because exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, we, we have the time. Uh, well, this is great. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank you both. This was wonderful. I, as always, I learned so much every time I talk to Lori. Uh, it's just amazing. And Erica, it was- And so Erica. <laughs> and I was getting to Erica. And it was nice getting to know Erica. I've known Lori a long time. Um, and again, it, I, and I had not, I was one of the people sitting there going, I'm not sure what TGNC is and I can't Google it because I've got multiple screens running. <laughs> um, but I see, I do use the internet, even though uh, I, I come from the world of books, but um, thank you so much. And I'd like to ask our audience, if you all can just rate this session uh, in the Whova app, we'd really appreciate it. And now everybody gets to go and take a break. <laughs> So thank, thank you, you so, so much. much everyone. Okay, bye.